Hi, I am Don Blackwell, and I am the Executive Director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Welcome to this episode of Truth on Wheels. One of the things that we do in this particular program is a segment called Coping. When we do the coping segments, we talk about various difficulties that Christians face in their lives, and particularly we try to interview people that have dealt with these things with a biblical and a godly perspective with the goal of helping other people to navigate these problems when they encounter them or maybe they are already encountering them. In this particular segment, we're going to talk about coping with the loss of a spouse. And I have here with me today a good friend, Brother Kerry Duke, and uh, Kerry lost his spouse a few years ago, and he has graciously agreed to be with us and discuss this very difficult topic with us. And so welcome to the program today, Kerry. Thank you, Don. It's good to be here. Well, we know that this is a difficult thing to discuss. Um, you've been very gracious to agree to do this. I know it could be emotional, and that's okay. The people who are watching this are going to be dealing with the same sort of thing. Sure. And so let's uh, delve in and talk about this. Okay. Um, tell us what your wife's name was. Her name was Leanne. Okay. And um, Leanne died from what? She died from a form of uh, blood cancer, which is called MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome. Okay. And that is a failure of the bone marrow to produce healthy blood cells. Okay. So what happens is, is that the stem cells normally reproduce, and they produce red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Okay. When you have MDS, it can affect any or all of those. Now, in her case, it was mostly a failure to produce, at least for the most part, healthy red blood cells. So there were not enough, and there were not enough healthy red blood cells. So at first, we didn't know, and the doctors didn't know what was happening because her, her iron count was very high, and yet her red blood cell count was very low. Okay. And so the hematologist said, we're going to have to do some tests here. So he, he said, it could be this, it could be that. And he said, don't think worst case scenario, which it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, he diagnosed it after a bone marrow biopsy and found out that it was indeed MDS. MDS is what some people used to call the precursor to leukemia, kind of like a pre-leukemia. Okay. But when... MDS becomes worse and worse, it turns into the worst kind of um, leukemia, which is uh, AML, um, um, which is deadly. Well, let's hold that thought for a minute. Sure. Um, I want to come back and talk about that. Absolutely. But um, I want to go back to the beginning. Um, I want you to tell me about how y'all met. Well, we met because of a mutual friend who was the preacher who was a student of mine, okay. and he heard me talking in class one day, and he knew that I was single, he knew that she was, she was a widow. Okay. She was a widow when I met her. So this will be hard. It's okay. So, he heard me say something in class one day. I was trying to explain some preacher concept. And he said, it clicked. There was something in the way that I said it. And he put the two together. Mm -hmm. So he finally, he finally encouraged me enough to call her. And he asked her, would you mind if he called you? And so we set it up. And so I'd never seen her, but we talked six hours. Before you had seen her? Okay. The first night. Okay. Wow. First call. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so there was just so much in common that, um, you know, there was no proposal that night or anything. Obviously, it took months. But you clicked instantly. We knew. Yeah. We knew. Yeah. Could. Were you... Um, 
nervous about seeing her for the first time? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, she was she was somewhat nervous because she had lost her husband. She had two small children. I was very nervous because I had been through a marriage before, mm-hmm. and my first wife had left me for an alcoholic in the congregation. Mm-hmm. And so I was very hesitant about it. Mm-hmm. But with her, I wouldn't say coaxing, but with her encouragement to meet mm-hmm. and to actually get to know each other, uh, she was very patient. Is there an age difference between you? She was two years older than me. Okay. So we had to kind of learn, you know, the Bible says that the wife is to be in subjection to the husband, mm-hmm. but the Bible, I've told people, also says that the younger are to be in subjection to the old. <laughs> so we kind of had to work that out. Yeah. My wife's two years older than me. <laughs> we might have to edit that part of it. <laughs> I might not want that in yeah. there. But um, how long did you date before you proposed Oh, I think it was probably about three or four months. Okay. Yeah. And it wasn't really a proposal. It was just, there was, it was there. Okay. And did you live far apart? About two hours apart. Okay. And as a matter of fact, the phone bills were so high that it was cheaper uh-huh. for us to get married than it was to keep up those. Back in those days, you had to pay long distance. Long distance, rates yeah. In state. That's so, right. Yeah, I remember that. Um. <laughs> I imagine when you think back, it's bringing you a lot of good memories, um, reliving those times, thinking about uh, when you were together. Um, did she work? Um, not a lot because we had four children. Uh, okay. Most of the time she did not. Okay. Yeah. Um, what did you like to do together? Uh, we loved 70s music. We mm-hmm. loved certain kinds of movies. Uh, We loved to ride around. We loved to go places, typical things. But I would say mostly just spend time together. Okay. Doing anything. Okay. Or or doing nothing. Yeah. Just being there. Now, the first time you saw her, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, the first time you saw her, what was your reaction? Wow. Okay. What was her reaction? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, She was pleased. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, good, good enough. I would have hated to have asked that. And that, that I oh, would know, but you know. yeah, well, that that's very good. Now, you're a preacher. Mm-hmm. This is another put you on the spot question. Okay. Is she a good preacher's wife? Yes. Yeah. Yes. She was the daughter of an elder. So she had, I believe, kind of an inside, an inside look or take at church affairs. Yeah. Uh, and her husband that had passed away in a tragic uh, automobile accident was a deacon in the church. <laughs> okay. So she'd been around, quote, the inner circle of church activities for all her life, yeah. taught Bible school, taught Bible classes, was was writing articles before I met her. As a matter of fact, yesterday I'd pulled out some of the um, some of the notebooks full of Bible lessons that she had taught. And I found a copy of an article that she wrote uh, in Christian Woman hmm. back in the early 90s. Hmm. That they, they published several in, in that journal. Interesting. And one of them before we got married. Huh. Yeah. You know, usually when I think of someone, there's a certain picture that just comes to my mind of that person. Um, how do you think of her when you think, when, when you think back and picture her in your mind? The, the words that several people have have used, uh, and I'm I'm thinking of a meeting that I held not long ago, and there was a, a young man that said she just had a graceful yeah. demeanor and presentation. Okay, was she um, happy type, upbeat? She was very happy with me. Yeah, and very happy with me. Uh, she was happy anyway, but. From everything that she told me, everything that her family has told me, she was just ecstatically happy. We just, some people say that, you know, they're like two peas in a pod. I'd I'd say we were like, we were like two magnets. It's just, it was just there. Yeah. How long ago did she pass? It was four years ago. She passed on January the 6th, 2020. 
And if I could just share this, the, the troubles that you go through and, you know, I'm, I'm sitting across from someone who's had a tragic accident. You're talking to someone who has experienced a great loss in life. The, the, those of you that are listening, you have so many issues, some far worse than, than mine, I'm sure. But that year was a tough, tough year, 2020. So in January the 6th, she passed away. Two months later, we had a terrible tornado here in Cookville. Yeah. And the president, President Trump, came and visited the, the site. Quite a few people died, and the whole community was just turned upside down trying to help. It was, it was just um, it was a trying time. And then in the midst of that, and just a few weeks later, COVID broke. Yeah. And so, you know, you have to avoid, you have to watch out being, I don't know, mm-hmm. You have to watch out for self-pity yeah. in any situation. But I look back at it and I think, wow, my world turned upside down in January and then the whole world turned upside down two months later. And the loneliness and the hopelessness that sometimes you felt was just, it was almost overwhelming. Uh, as you're saying this, I'm, I guess it's natural that We run through in our own minds what was going on. And, of course, the end of 2019, 2019 is when I had my accident that's left me a paraplegic. And I was in the hospital for about three months. Mm -hmm. I got out of the hospital in August of 2019. So then 2020, uh, COVID hits. And so we were both going through turmoil at the same time. Right. And uh, I don't guess we even knew each other at the time Mm -hmm. except You know, I I knew who you were, but we had not Mm -hmm. met. But um, going through the same, not the same turmoil, but massive turmoil at the same time. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Um, When Leanne passed, was she ready to go? She was ready. She was ready. And again, I don't want to apologize for it taking some time to get these feelings out because it's been a while since I brought these forward. And it's good. It's good therapy for me to do it. I know it's good for the audience. Um, basically, you've got two sets of people, two groups of people that, that are listening, those of you that are listening. Some of you have not been through this. Some of you have. So some of you that um, have not been through it, a lot of what I say you will understand, but it won't really make that much sense. Um, and I'll try to explain a little bit more about that. Uh, as best I can to help you because I, I tell people if it hasn't happened to you, if you are married and if it has not happened to you, basically it's going to. Yeah. It's going to because one of, one of you will die. It's the rare exception that both die at the same time. Those of you that are in my shoes, some of you have lived with this longer than I have. This is, you know, a little after four years. Some of you have been through 10 or 15, 20 years of of being a widow or a widower. By the way, the Bible talks a lot about widows, uh, not a whole lot specifically about widowers. And you try to find information in there. But um, what was your question? Um, (laughs) I I had asked if she... We do this a lot when we have lunch. (laughs) That's true. We we go all over the world preaching the gospel. And so... (laughs) Let's say I asked you two questions. Was she ready to go and how long has it been? Um, but I was going to ask you this question. Sure. When, what triggered you that there was a problem in the first place? Uh, she was pale. She was short of breath. This was uh, early 2015. Okay. And we couldn't figure it out. Okay. It was almost like she was about to faint. And um, she said, something's not right here. And so then she went to one doctor, went to another doctor, ended up at the hematologist and when she went to the hematologist, I'll tell you this, uh, this is where it really changed my life from that moment. It was in 2015, June the 1st, 2015, because that's when we got the results from the bone marrow biopsy. Mm-hmm. And he said, this is MDS, and I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And he showed us charts of what happens when your blood cells fail or when they fail to develop and reproduce properly. Mm -hmm. And he said, in your particular case, you've got 
you've got an issue at this level, this level, and this level. And here is the median life expectancy. And what did he say? He, he wouldn't say it out loud. He pointed to it. He was being very tactful. He pointed, and I can see it with my eyes, 8.8 years. And she, she didn't live five. And so we left that meeting. And I wouldn't say that I was upbeat. I don't mean that at all. I, I wasn't terribly discouraged. But when we stepped into the elevator, I can barely breathe. It hit me. And I looked at her and I said, he just told you how long you have to live. She said, yeah. Yeah. And then that night I had to do a wedding rehearsal for a young couple and marry them the next day. So our work goes on. You know, the thing that, that you know so well and you have told people so many times, I'm sure, is that as, as a member of the church, when you go and sit in the pew, and you don't have to wait on the Lord's table. You don't have to lead the prayer. You certainly don't have to preach. And you are overwhelmed with a problem, and your heart is absolutely breaking. And you, you, you may feel like that people are watching you, but you don't have to to really, you don't really have to brace yourself for getting up in front of an audience. With us, yeah, we could be up the entire night before. Yeah. We could not have had any sleep the night before or very little sleep and our hearts and our minds are absolutely in chaos but you have to pull it together and with the lord's help you do it i've had meetings that were just heart-wrenching crushing right before services and then you get up and preach mm -hmm. and it's so very difficult to do it is it's, it's amazing how that works out though because I, I know what you do you pray and i just say lord you got to do this. You got to help me here. And it always, it always does. It always works out. So you said five years she lived. Can you not quite, not quite. Can you walk me through what sure. that five years was like? Sure. At first she was in relatively fairly good health as far as energy was concerned and quality of life was concerned because at that point they were trying less invasive forms of therapy, no chemo at that point. And so she would take those injections to try to, to try to increase her red blood cell count. And it worked a little, but not that much. So during, during all this time, she had to get blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we had a list at the church at the West End Church of Christ in Livingston. We had a list, uh, so that people could sign up and give blood to her. Hmm. You know, they would have to have the same blood type. But they literally, I say, gave their blood, sweat, and tears to, to us and to her. Uh, and, and by the way, also, one of the first things that, that hit me in those early days was Leviticus 17, 11. Life is in the blood. And if you don't have the blood, you don't have life. And it was one of the most difficult things. It, it, it's hard to compare. It's impossible really to to evaluate one person's situations to another. Some people lose a mate quickly. Yeah. It's, it's an accident, it's a heart attack, something like that. But I watched her die for almost five years. So you were the caregiver? Yes, not the only one, yeah. um, but the main one. And toward the end, we had family members, but she had blood transfusions. And so that was difficult. When her blood would get low, I'm just sharing something that was just, it was just tough. You know, we'd be at a restaurant and I'd look at her hands and it was sometimes the color of a, of a deceased person. And that would, I would just look at her hands and it would absolutely crush me. I didn't think I could breathe, you know, and I would try not to express, you know, how bad it was hurting to her, but... She could read it. She knew. It. But anyway, so that first year, that's what we did, 2015. 2016 was traveling a lot, and it was exhausting because we flew to Houston, Texas, to one of the premier cancer treatment centers in the world, which is MD Anderson, mm -hmm. the experts. Yeah. And so we did that for about a year, and Leanne said, I, I, I want to have a stem cell transplant. 
she said, I think it's come to that. That's what I want to do. There are two different schools of thought on how to treat this, but she said, I think I want to do the stem cell transplant. And she said, I'm doing it for you. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm not doing it for me. Wow. So 2017, we went to Sarah Cannon and met with a doctor there who had actually worked at MD Anderson. A uh, very nice guy. She and Leanne clicked and they had a very transparent relationship. She could tell him what was on her mind. He could tell her just the cold hard facts and they had a great relationship in that way. Mm -hmm. So she disagreed with some proposed treatment. She would just tell him straight, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, okay, okay. But 2017 was the tough one mm -hmm. because that was the year of the stem cell transplant. And when people hear the words stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant, they think of, you know, drilling a hole in the, in the bone and, and, you know, extracting and then infusing and so forth. But it's, 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 it's much simpler than that. The dangerous part of a stem cell transplant is the extreme chemotherapy. Is it a painful process? It is, it is painful, but it's dangerous because they basically deplete the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets with so much chemotherapy, with so much chemo. So and I watched the chart. Makes you weak and sick. Oh, you just, she was in the hospital for a month mm. in, in the, um, in, in a special section of the hospital so that she wouldn't mm. contract diseases and so forth. So that was, that was very tough. And then she had to spend almost three months in an apartment near hospital so that she could check in and out and see how she was doing. So we had members of the church, family members that came and stayed with her. And um, I've told people, one of the things that I've learned from this, we talk about how generous and loving God's people are. Yeah. I didn't know the half of it. Yeah. I did not know at all what I was talking about when I would say things like that in the sermon because just just the West End Church where I was preaching alone. Dying, it was, I didn't have to do anything. Yeah. They wouldn't let me mow. Yeah. They wouldn't let me buy anything. They wouldn't let me spend any money. If I had asked them, if I had said, hey, why don't you just tear down my house and build me another one? I've, I've joked with people and said, I don't think they'd turn me down. It's I've just had, amazing. I've had the same experience, right. brethren, have taking care of me in ways that uh, have just been mind-blowing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So that was 2017 with yeah. the stem cell transplant. And her brother, Paul, gave the stem cells. And I sat there with his wife, Gail, as they extracted the stem cells. And so he was a match. Now, she had a twin sister, which is very interesting. Yeah. She has a twin sister, Linda. And we thought from the beginning, that she's a perfect match yeah. to do the stem cell transplant. And the head doctor of, of the transplant had, w was having a, a final meeting. They'd done all these tests, and he was having a, a final meeting just to shore up all the information that they had obtained from the other test. So he was talking to the doctors and the nurses, and he said, are we ready? He said, okay, what, what about the geneticist? We have that report here. And, and um, he said, call her, call the geneticist and make sure that, that we understand that Linda, her sister, her twin sister, is the one, the match. They called the geneticist and she said, no, that is not what I said in my report. I said just the opposite. Her, her sister is too close in her genetics. Her DNA is too close. And so if you put her stem cells in there, they won't recognize those cancer cells either. They'll respond in the same way. She's too close. I'd wow. never heard that before. Wow. My mother was uh, the recipient of of a kidney transplant. Hmm. And so I'd heard it, you know, all the talk about matches and, and, and the points, you know, six out of ten. And, and Linda was ten out of ten. Wow. But she was just too much. And so they're identical twins. They're identical twins. Yeah. And they only found that out at that late point in life when they were 62 by doing that test. I had never knew that before. So, so Paul did that and they, they hooked up, if, if, if you will, they, they put, you know, the, the IV device here and they extracted his blood 
ran it through kind of a centrifuge that, that slings out, for lack of, lack of better terms, um, that, that causes the stem cells, which are heavier mm -hmm. than the, the reds, the whites, and the platelets, to the outside. And then they're collected in a bag, and it was just a regular I, IV bag. Hmm. And so I watched as they took that to the room. The doctors weren't even in there. Hmm. And the, the, the nurse hooked that up, and it took about an hour. That was the transplant. Wow. And so when you hear about all the the complications and the dangers and the risk of a stem cell transplant, it a, a lot of it is the, the chemotherapy before and of course the constant monitoring and so forth. But but that happened in twenty seventeen. After she got on her feet, after about two or three months, especially after about three or four months, she said, You know, I'm almost feeling normal again. Hmm. I'm almost there. But then after about I would say seven or eight months, she said, I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm just telling you just to let you know. When her blood would get low before, mm -hmm. she said that she would have a swishing sound in her ears. And she said, I'm hearing that swishing sound again. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, okay, thanks for letting me know. Too. And so about two months later, we found out that the cancer was back. And then that was that was 2018. We're getting into probably May or so of 2018. And she said, okay, what are my options? And they recommended one treatment and they said, well, that's it's kind of dangerous. And she said, she was very frank about it. She was always very practical. She said to the doctor, she said, I'm not going through that. And then she pointed at me. Hmm. She said, no. She said, I'm not putting him through that yeah. anymore. So 2018 was hard. She said, okay, how long do I have to live? And he said, without any treatments, three to six months. He said, with treatments, maybe we can extend that. She said, what kind of treatments? He, and he recommended chemo, some follow-up chemo, which she did, but... Um, she said, okay, if I don't do anything after this, after those follow-up chemo, she said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm tired, and I'm just finished. She said, how long do I have? And he said, this will turn into a AML, acute myeloid leukemia, mm -hmm. which is aggressive, and it's, it's deadly for, for somebody, especially over 60. And he said, once that happens, he said, you could have three to eight weeks, something, somewhere in there. But, and so she, she did, she, she survived through 2018. We got into 2019, and this was probably the hardest year because here we are in the middle of 2019, and she's still living. Huh. And so she's saying, what, what's this about? Why am I here? And, and how was she feeling at that point? Not good. Okay. She did not have pain. That was the weird thing about this is that it's not like a tumor. A blood cancer is what they call a liquid tumor. Hmm. So it's throughout your body. Hmm. A, a tumor can give you pain in, in a certain area, but a liquid tumor is it's just different. And it just makes you feel horrible. Yeah. You're weak. And there's a feeling, she said, she said, I cannot describe this any other way. There, she said, it feels like there's something crawling underneath my skin. Hmm. And so she had that feeling. And, um, you know, she was faithful at church, you know, continued to teach women's um, Bible class on Wednesday morning and 10 other services go with me everywhere I went. Uh, but she, she sometimes would ask me, especially as it got worse, she would say, why am I here? When, when she got to the point to where she couldn't do anything much except just sit at the house, yep. why am I here? And I told her, I said, I'm confident that I will live to see the day when that question will be answered. I said, I believe that with all my heart. Good. For now, I don't know. Good. I can see some things. I can see some benefits now. But someday I, I will live to see that. And so her, her situation progressed or digressed. And in September, September the 15th of 2019, 
her white blood cells went to about 36,000. And that was one of the signs, look out, it's coming. Mm -hmm. And so we put her under hospice care. She said, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to go. And she lived until January of the next year. Mm -hmm. And so it was a slow, slow process. And that's where she got so discouraged. Why am I here? And I said, well, I've, I've learned, and I preach this a lot because of what I've learned from that. It's okay to say that things happen for a reason. And when we say they happen, we don't mean that they just by luck happen. We mean by God's providence that they happen. But I told her, I said, I've learned to say that things happen for reasons. I don't know all the reasons. I can't see them, but I know that there are people, there are situations that your situation will have effect on for years to come. I just don't know what they are. Yeah. And I still believe that. I, I've said similar things because people will say, well, it happened for a reason, implying that God made it happen. And I said, there's two very different things. One is that God is micromanaging our lives. I don't believe that. But I do believe that providentially, when we make choices, regardless of whether I do good or bad, yes. God can accomplish his will and he can use anything to accomplish good right. providentially. Yes, yes. I saw things during that last four months that I had never seen before. And we also preach patience. There are a lot of things that you see. Those of you that are widows or widowers or in other situations, you've had a child to die, whatever it is, you see things you would have never seen before about the scriptures. Yeah, I, I know that Alexander Campbell's son-in-law, W.K. Pendleton, lost his wife, which was Campbell's daughter. Mm -hmm. And he wrote an article about that, and he said, I've lost everything. I've lost everything. And he said, I thought I knew the meaning of the words, thy will be done. Good. He basically said, I didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. He said, no, nah, no. Yeah. Nah, no. By the way, Campbell, Campbell lost his first wife. Yeah. Margaret, I think was her name. And then he ended up remarrying mm -hmm. a young woman that was helping to take care of Margaret that Margaret had encouraged her husband to marry if something would, would happen to her. <laughs> Did your wife ever talk about that with you? Oh, or? yes. Yes. Yes, she was very, very plain about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, she encouraged that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she didn't hesitate about that at all. Yes. But Campbell lost 10 of his 14 children by the time he was my age. Wow. By the time he was 61, I'm 64, but with, by the time he was 61, he had lost one wife and he'd lost 10 of his 14 children. That's why I'm, I, it bothers me when I hear younger or older preachers who say, well, you're just a follower of Alexander Campbell and he wasn't right about this and wasn't right about that. Well, I didn't say he was right about everything anyway. I'm not a follower of Alexander Campbell, but you know, Don, one of the things that bothers me is that I see a lack of respect for the character of these men. Yeah. What they went through, and they were able to keep their sanity. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I, th that bothers me. But at any rate, getting back to the four-month period, I've learned and still have a lot to learn about patience. But I learned from her what patience is from two or three standpoints. Number one, just being able to cope and have a sense of humor. You know, I'll just tell you a few things. If she were here, she'd probably kill me for saying these things. things, but you know, she, she couldn't get up much. She got to the point where she was so weak, she could just sit on the couch and, you know, I would have to help her to walk and then we got a wheelchair and, and use that in the house. And there was a little, there was not much in the way of eating that she could eat that, that really appealed to her. So she liked these protein shakes. Mm -hmm. So I would get her a lot of these chocolate protein shakes, and the more chocolate, the better. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be in the kitchen, let's say, I'd be across the room, and I'd be doing something, and she'd be enjoying the protein shake. And before I knew it, there would come this protein bottle, this empty protein bottle sailing past me. She'd throw it <laughs> at me. And, and that was like lifting 200 pounds off my shoulders. That helped a lot. There was one time where I was walking her across the floor, and we were both exhausted. I was physically and emotionally exhausted. She was exhausted. It was getting near the end. And you remember the old Carol Burnett show? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll test the age of the audience here. Mm -hmm. 
you remember Tim Conway used to imitate an old man mm -hmm. and he used yep. to shuffle around, move real slowly and talk very slowly? I did, yeah. Well, when I was helping her across the floor, she would have to take very, very small steps. And every time that happened, it would break my heart. I mean, it just crushed you. And she lifted another 500 pounds off the other shoulder. When she just looked at me, she said, I feel like Tim Conway. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but let me get back to, let me get back to the, the idea of patience here. She, she had gone through situations in her Christian journey where she would get discouraged because like preachers and every other Christian, she had taught people, she had taught classes, she tried and tried and tried to connect and see the fruits of her Christian life and especially her teaching and her talking to people. Yeah. And she was just discouraged at that. And in the last four months of her life, I just never seen so many people come and say, Leanne, you don't know how much you helped me. Especially young women, they couldn't get enough they could not get enough. I know that there was one young lady that mm. was eventually baptized, and she was not a Christian at the time, and she'd kind of gotten close to Leanne because of some of the classes she taught. Now, this is about a month before she passed away. And so she wanted to have a Bible study with Leanne. Now, Leanne can't get up and walk. Yeah. You know, she's not supposed to. Wow. I didn't think she could because she's very weak. She, within a, a month, you know, she's, she's going to be gone. We didn't know that at the time, but anyway, this young lady wanted to study with her, and so they arranged a time, and so I stayed back in the bedroom. I just let them talk, and do you know that, that they talked for over five hours? Wow. Now, my wife was a talker. <laughs> she was a talker, but in her weakened state, she was so enthused. It had to be pure adrenaline. She was so enthused about helping this young lady learn the gospel. And one of the things she said to me was, she said, I hope and I pray that God will let me live long enough to see her baptized. And he did. About two weeks later, she was baptized. Wow. So then the last two weeks of her life were just very, very hard. Hospice was there. Continual decline in her physical strength, continual decline in, in just her ability to comprehend and communicate with you. And so I was holding her hand yep. when she passed. And, and you can't get that out of your mind because there's just, there's something that happens there that never leaves you. It, it will never, it will never leave me. And so that's why I tell people, I, I preach to the men harder than the women, but I preach to the women too. You know, when you, when you've gone through something like this or what you've gone through, you can be very bold and blunt with people, yeah. and, and you need to be sometimes. You, you have to hit people pretty hard. So I tell the men oftentimes in sermons when I'm talking about how you treat the wife, I tell them you hold your wife's hand as often as you can because someday it'll be for the last times. Good. Someday that will be it. And I, this is what I preach. I said, I can't bind this. So I'll just kind of smile as I say this. This is not a law, but people at West End, I've preached there for 27 years. They know that I say things like this sometimes, but especially since, since this has happened to me. Don't pass up an opportunity to show affection to your wife. Mm -hmm. And the rule that I set forth was, I said, have this rule at your house. I call it the three foot or the three feet rule. Do not come within three feet of your wife without touching her in some way. Mm -hmm. Just a pat on the back, touch her hand. More than that, even better, wines, same thing. One of the, um, one of the young men in church is a deacon now, after I preached that sermon for the first time, uh, his, his wife was out in the uh, foyer and she was talking to me and he reached over to her and went, <laughs> And just looked at me and smiled. I said, well, that's a start. You yeah, know? in the right direction. But you, you think about things that, that, you, that you never would otherwise. Can you tell me what piece of advice you might give to caregivers? Because no doubt there are people that are watching this program are caregivers. Yeah. And they haven't reached this point yet, but 
but you're headed there. Yeah, let, let me say something to the caregivers. And if you can re remind me, I wanted to say something about associating with widows and widowers to the widows and the widowers and also to the people who are not. And mm -hmm. you could remind me. Sure. Um, I would say as a caretaker, you, you have to realize that they say things that they don't really mean. Yeah. That's big. That's huge. They're going to get angry. They have a lot of anger. Uh, I asked my wife one time, I said, do you sometimes get frustrated because you can't get up and do things the way that the rest of us? And she said, only about 50 times a day. Huh. So sometimes she would get very frustrated, very angry, and that's just natural. I don't think that I was as prepared for that as I needed to be, and I didn't realize the amount of anger that was in me especially when she would be angry with me, it would hurt. And so the natural response is to fire back. And so, yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, we got into some, some spats, yeah. you know, and I look back at it and in one way I'm ashamed, but in another way, I don't know how we could have avoided it because the stress, the stress was so intense and overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, when, when Job was in the physical, as well as the emotional state that he was in, it's no wonder that he was so sarcastic with his friends. Yeah. Well, no doubt, you're the people. Wisdom's going to die with you. Yeah. Physicians of no value. You know, I'll try. Um, so it's easy to um, it's easy to judge if you've not been there. But if you are a caregiver, or if you ever are a caregiver, you really have to be selfless. You really have to put your interests um, in, in in the background. And, and, and pray to God, and, and also don't feel guilty for getting help because you can't do it all yourself. Yeah. You might have to. I mean, there, there's some situations. I'm talking about the ideal situation. The ideal situation is, is for you to do your part, the most of it, but you must have help. And so the, the, the principle of asking and, and accepting help is very, very important in that way. Uh, let me say something also about visiting somebody who is very, very sick like that. Mm -hmm. There are two extremes. When you go to visit somebody who has cancer, who is dying, you, you can talk about your problems or your situation that this person has reminded you of. Well, you know, I've got an uncle that's got cancer and he died from cancer or something like that. That may or may not be best. I'm not trying to prejudge every situation, but you can talk a little bit too much about things like that. Yeah. The other extreme that I have noticed in more Christians, I think, is where they are afraid to talk about anything personal, yeah. and they constantly ask questions. Well, what do, you, what do you think about this? And what are the doctors saying? And that's okay to an extent. But the thing you need to remember about somebody that is bedridden or in a situation like that is. They need to feel useful. Yeah. They need to feel that they are doing something. And so this young lady that came and wanted to talk with Leanne, I, I didn't tell the whole story. Leanne was so pumped up about that. I heard the door shut, and I thought, well, I have to go in there and get her off the couch. Hmm. She opened the bedroom door and said, well, I really feel pumped. Hmm. And she said, we had a good study. She was supposed to be on her feet. Well, in my mind, she wasn't because she was so weak that she can barely walk. Yeah. But there was that surge of energy that was there. So um, these are just some things that, that you think about, but sometimes it's good to share something. You have to be wise about it. Don't overdo it. But sometimes, especially if you're a friend and, and, and a loved one, a brother and sister in Christ, it might be okay to say, I've got a problem here. You know, my son's giving me trouble or, I don't mean to unload on you. you got enough on your shoulders. What I found with Leanne is that that didn't put anything on her shoulders. It relieved some of her burden. Yeah. Because it got her mind off of it. Yeah. And you have to be, you just have to have courage about that. And, and let me say also that it is common. If you haven't been through a situation where you've lost a spouse, a lot of people are scared to talk to us. Yeah. They're afraid to talk to us because, and especially they're terrified to ask us questions about our mate. Yeah. Oh no, he'll start crying, you know. Well, so what? That's right. 
that's that's fine. We're we're fine with that. But I have found that a lot of people will avoid that. And Don, it's when you first asked me to do this, I thought I don't have any advice to give to people. This I don't even understand this. Um, and so I may be drifting, but I, but I have to do this while I'm thinking about it because if there if there are a few points that I can help people with, it's that. When you lose a spouse, I don't think it's possible to express how you feel. I don't think it'll ever be possible for me to do that. Mm -hmm. um, C.S. Lewis wrote a booklet. You might get that. It's called A Grief Observe. Great little book. He talked about feeling numb around other people. He said, I would go and I would be with other people, but I wasn't with them. He said, I'd, I'd hear them, and it was just like I was in a different zone. C.S. Lewis couldn't do it. Yeah. I think if anybody could do it, he could. My wife said to me, who had been a widow, just about two weeks before she passed away, she said, this is going to be hard. Good. She said, it's going to be really hard. I never thought about that. She knew what you were going to go through because she'd already done it. Yeah, and you would think, you would think maybe that she would be able to give me some pointers. She said, I can't tell you how to do this. I cannot tell you how to do this. How many years were you married? With almost 30. Almost 30. And I'd heard her talk about this many times before, but when it comes to really expressing it, she said, I can't do it. Uh, by the way, I had a, a good friend also that uh, was a preacher. He was a preacher. He was a chaplain. He was a funeral home owner and director. And he had lost his wife about 14 years before the time that I'm going to refer to. So he and I had retouched base. We had known each other for some time, but I think by the providence of God, he put us together again, you know, in just the right time around 2018, 2019. And he talked to me a lot about his situation. He was really taking heart even after 14 years. <laughs> And so he, he told me, and, and I'm, I'm going back here to, to your question about caretakers. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are articles, there's especially an approach called the seven stages of grief, the grief stages. Some of them will say four, some of them will say seven. And he said, you need to read that. And he, he talked about the people that he'd counseled with, in different situations. He was not just a grief counselor, but a counselor in different different areas. And he said he'd had different people ask him, is there anything I can do to prepare for the loss of a spouse? So after he went through different scenarios and different angles to that for about 10 minutes, he said, there's not anything you can do. Yeah. There's not anything. So I can't give you a magic bullet. I can't give you a three-step approach and say, here's how you do it. My wife couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. It just can't be done. And, and I wanted to say something about the fear that people have of, of talking to widows and widowers. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't understand it ourselves. Right. And so sometimes we may want to talk about it, but I never know when. If you ask me about it, sometimes I will just pour out my heart. At other times, I will just say, well, I'm doing okay, you know. Sometimes you want to be around people. Sometimes you don't want to be around people, and you never know when. Yeah. But one of the reasons, well, let me say that there are several reasons why that, that widows and widowers don't talk a lot about it. I'd always noticed that. I'd always wondered, why don't they talk about it more? And now I get it. Number one, you can't put it into words. Yeah. And when you try, it doesn't make sense. Hey. You will talk for five or ten minutes and you'll say, that didn't make any sense. Hey. And it doesn't make any sense to me, but that those are the feelings coming out. So number one, you just can't find the words to express it. Number two, it's very painful. Sometimes you need to do that. This has been good for me today, hmm. you know, to go back and, and to, to recall some of these things. Number three, it's just not possible to relate to it unless you're there. Yeah. You just don't think of things. I, I thought, Don, being a preacher, 
over the past four years about doing what I'm about to to suggest to you, I thought about writing a little book mm -hmm. for husbands mm -hmm. and for wives, things you should appreciate about your spouse. Mm -hmm. And I am confident that I could have filled up a huge book. Mm -hmm. Confident. There are little things, just like your situation, little things that people don't even think about. Yeah. You know, parking places, getting in and out of a vehicle, things you've talked to me about before, uh, being a widow or a widower. You, you can't say when you're driving, hey, is anything coming that way? Mm -hmm. See it. If you lose something around the house, you're to blame. <laughs> <laughs> If the bill's not paid, it's on your shoulders. There's so many things like that. So he, he helped me a lot, getting back to the counselor, he helped me a lot in just talking to me about those things and, and encouraging me along the way. There's, sorry to, to, to give such a long answer to a question, but uh, I have some copies of a great little piece, not even an article that was written by someone. I have no idea who wrote it. My wife found this a few weeks before she passed away, and she wanted it read at her memorial. It doesn't have a title. It doesn't have an author. I don't know where she got it. Hmm. But the image that, that the man who says, I'm an old man, and I'm, this, is, this is how it's going to be when you lose a spouse or a loved one at all, it's like shipwreck. And the ship has been broken to a thousand pieces. Your life is broken in a thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. And all you can do at sea, because you're swimming, you're trying to keep from drowning in the grief, you grab hold of something. Good. You grab hold of it, you hold on to it. And then a, a hundred foot wave hits you. Yes. And it rolls you. And that's, that's how you feel, even physically, mm -hmm. physically. The first year, I would say, Don, the first year after she died, it was just trying to breathe. Hmm. It was just trying to breathe. Hmm. And literally, sometimes, sometimes it would just hit you and it would just paralyze you. You couldn't walk. You'd have to just kind of basically fall to the floor. Hmm. And so this man in this article said, sometimes the waves are 100 feet sometimes 50, sometimes 30. Hmm. You'll do well for a while. You grab onto something, hold on to it, and here comes another 80-foot wave, and it rolls you. You're going to get wet. You're going to get rolled. You're just trying to survive. And he said, within time, and he said it's different for everybody. Within time, the waves get lower. Hmm. But they're always there. You never know what's going to trigger it. You listen to a song, and it hits you. I've asked a lot of uh, widows and widowers the question over the years, what's the hardest part? And frequently I have been told it's nighttime when I go to bed. Oh, yeah. Would, would, would you agree with that? Yeah. I remember you asking me that question one time, and I remember my response when I finally got it out. I said, everything. Yeah. Everything's hard. Um because your whole life is just so different. And it, that's what is so difficult to put into words. Nothing feels the same. Nothing feels the same. And nighttime is very hard because I'm working. I, I, have, I have the luxury, I have the blessing of having a lot to do yeah. and a lot of people, a lot of people that, that tell me they need my help, that, that love me and respect me. And I, I, I don't know what I'd do without them. Now, I sometimes hear people say, um, I'll never remarry. Is that, is that your sentiment? No. No. God knows, yeah. and I want to use the most wisdom that I can. I find that there are two extremes in the advice that people give you. Some people are just, close the door. You don't need to do that. Now, they haven't said that to me, but I've heard that over the years. Yeah. You don't need to do that. It's all negative. And with some people, I would say, yes. I mean, you don't want to get in an unscriptural marriage. Sure. You don't want to use bad judgment right. either. And on the other hand, you don't want to get in a hurry. Yeah. And you don't want to use poor judgment in a situation. Yeah. But, yeah, I just, um, I'm, God knows, and I'm just trying to trust in God. Now. Um, 
if I could follow up on that, sure. That article. Oh yeah. I, I've brought hard copies of it here. Okay. Uh, if I knew how to tell you where to access that on the internet, I would. If nothing else, we could get it typed and maybe put it somewhere where you could access it. Sure. I, I probably just need to do that. Sure. If we can get it typed, I'll make it available on okay. uh, the GBN web page under transcripts. Okay. And we'll put it there. That That is an article. They're in files there, and I carry those in my vehicle. I've made a ministry hmm. of passing those out. Hmm. Anytime that I go to a funeral, anytime that I know that somebody has lost a level, especially a spouse, I give them that article because it's just, it's, it's a great article. Now, you mentioned something that's very unique, and that is that Leanne has a twin sister. Yes. And um, it begs a lot of questions. Uh, when you see her, does that bring up a flood of emotions for you? Is it like seeing Leanne? No. Uh, at first, it was very difficult, and and not just difficult because of her, but because let's say of her brother Paul, who gave, who saved her life mm -hmm. with the stem cells. It was very difficult at first because there were just so many intimate moments there. Yeah, um, they shared a bond, not just spiritually and and as far as family is concerned, but because of of him giving the stem cells. But with with her twin sister Linda, um. There, there are just differences there that it, I, I would say for the first year it was difficult, but it's gotten somewhat easier. But I mean, their expressions and their mannerisms, it's, I, I would have to say, Don, that after four years, it's, it's easier, much easier now. I, I guess I've just gotten used to it. Hmm. And, and I respect her as, as her own individual person yeah. and, and, and both of them in that way. Now, we, we've gotten a little long, but I, I do want to ask this. One of the main purposes of this program is to focus on the hope that people can have. What keeps you going? I want people to think about uh, the Lord and about mm -hmm. the Bible. And mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you plan to see Leanne again one day. Um, yes. What, um, what keeps you going at this point? Number one, the, the work of the gospel. I've been blessed to have good health and sound mind and to have the the privilege, and I counted a, a, a privilege and a blessing for brethren to say, hey, come and preach for us. Yeah. That is, it's not a right that I have as a preacher or any other preacher's right that we can demand. That is an honor. And, and I count that a distinct opportunity um, working with GBN you know, the work that I do at the college, the work that I do at West End Church of Christ, other congregations, writing, things like that. It keeps my mind going, and I love it. Um, I would say, too, that um, little things like, you know, your grandchildren, children and grandchildren, yeah. but they're just such a joy. Speaking of children at the congregation where I'm at, the, the little children there, almost every Sunday and Wednesday, they take 500 pounds off of their shoulder. Or if I come in with 100 pounds on this shoulder, they just sense something. Yeah. Sometimes the little girls will come and sit with me on the front pew. Yeah. I don't ask them to do that. Yeah. How do they know that? How do they know that I'm down? And yeah. and while they're sitting there, I'm thinking, wow, they have no idea what they just did. You know, just not saying a word. So that and then try your best to keep a good sense of humor. Mm. And my sense of humor is completely off the wall. It's completely odd to some people, but it works for me. So uh, if nobody's around, I entertain myself. I never, I do a lot of handwritten stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a trash can across the room. You, you all can't see it, but there's a trash can there. I never, if I wad up a piece of paper, I never walk and throw it and, and, and put it in the trash can. I always throw it. And sometimes I'll turn my back to it, throw it behind my back. See, to you, that may not work. To you, that might be a waste of time. To me, that's entertaining. <laughs> right. Um, you ever heard the Screaming Goats? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. We love the Screaming Goats. Okay. Yeah. Well, we got something in common yeah. here then. I have a little miniature plastic Screaming Goat. So you push it down, and it gives that sound. Yeah. I do that every day before I leave the house and when I get home. Um, all kinds of little things like that. Yeah. So try, try to have fun. And, of course... Uh, Bible study, just 
the, the, the man that I was telling you about that was a counselor on the funeral home, a widower that we had so much in common, he said, the only time that I can really, really get this grief off my mind is when I'm reading the Bible. Hmm. And I would say amen to that, and I would say amen also to preaching. That is probably the one time where it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Because I can focus completely on it. Is there a passage or a Bible character that has particularly given you strength? Oh, so many. Job, of course. Yeah. Paul. Um, Timothy. Um, it basically every story, everything I read gives me strength. It's hard to pick any Daniel, um, Hezekiah, just so many people in the Bible. Do you ever feel like Paul in Philippians 1 when he says, the King James, I'm in a strait betwixt two things. We oh, don't talk sure. that way, but oh, sure. um, you know, I'm torn to stay and do the work of the Lord, but to depart, he says, is far better. I'm glad you brought that up because I think, personally, I think it's common and almost natural to want to die yeah. in some situations. Yeah. I, and I don't think that that's intrinsically sinful. No. Paul, it, it wasn't with Paul. Paul said, I want to die. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. So it doesn't mean that you're suicidal necessarily. It doesn't mean that you're sinning. It just means there's not much in this world to hold you. Yeah. And so, yes, I believe that. And I think that that you need to be prepared for that. To have that feeling is not necessarily wrong. I know the first year for me was just total grief and trying to survive. The second year was quite a bit of anger. Yeah. Third year was beginning to acclimate. The fourth year uh, was was more adjusting. But I do believe that we need to to counsel and teach people about our attitude toward death. That it is not it is not a sinful thought in and of itself to want to die and to want to go. And I, you know, when I when I think about that, there is just a real peaceful feeling that comes over me. And and I'll tell you, you know, I. I mentioned W.K. Pendleton, who said that he thought he knew the meaning of the words, thy will be done, mm -hmm. but he didn't. I thought I knew the meaning of the words, live one day at a time. Of course, Jesus' words are, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself, Matthew 6, verse 34. <clears throat> I thought I knew what it meant when I told people, live one day at a time because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, James 4, you know, 15, if the Lord will. Right. I thought I knew what that meant, but I didn't really fathom and appreciate what I was saying until now. Yeah. When I say now, look, I will be there if I can. Yeah. yeah. I will do this if I can. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to make it home. I and mean, we say that in sermons all the time. We, we as preachers, as we extend the invitation, say, you don't know if you're going to make it home. I don't know if I'm going to make it home. When I say that now... Mm -hmm. I mean it. I know it. I know that I don't have the promise of another second. Yeah. And it takes losing someone, I suppose, to to really get that point. Let me ask you one more question and we'll wrap up. Do you still, do you grieve every day? I would say yes. Yes, I do. Not necessarily in tears. The grief is always there. You never know when it's going to erupt. Yeah. And the the emptiness, Don, the one thing about, again, the interview that I have, I, I just don't have an ability to explain it. There is a feeling that is there that is not just grief. Mm -hmm. It's grief. I, I can't even find the words for it. It's grief. It's emptiness. It's loneliness. Um, it's all that and much fear, all that wrapped together. And you can't put your finger on it. You don't know what to do. And and the illustration that I've used with with several people is this: if if you're at a restaurant with your wife and she says, "I need to step aside for a few minutes. I need to go to the restroom or whatever," and five minutes go by, and then ten minutes go by, but then fifteen minutes go by, mm -hmm. there's a feeling that's there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an anxiousness. Mm -hmm. There's almost a continual. I don't know if I would say anxiousness, but there is that emptiness, loneliness, anxiousness that's always there. 
except in some situations where you're really, really laughing or you're preaching a sermon or you're really into your Bible study, teaching a class and things like that. And so I, I would say that, yes, I do, but it varies in how I do that. It may be one tear because I hear a song yeah. that reminds me of something. It may be seeing one of the grandkids and wishing right now. I don't know. Good, good. I don't know. So, and if I could say, I didn't know I was going to talk this long about this, but several members of the church have asked me, what can we do? What can we do? And they really mean it. Mm -hmm. how, how can we help? What just do, can we take you out to eat? Can, can we just spend the weekend with you? Whatever, what can we do to, to, to fix this when you can't? Yeah. And in what I have told several of them is, I don't even know. Yeah. I don't know what I want. Yeah. From, from this minute to the next hour, because your, your feelings change. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say that if you had talked to me about the meaning of a passage today, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's talk about exegeting this passage. You know, we would, we would engage the logical so side of our minds and we would talk about that, you know, this part, I can't make sense of some of this. Yeah. This is the best I can do. Yeah. Well, thank you. We thank you. appreciate it. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. We have been talking about some very serious things today. If you are a widow or widower, or if you are a caregiver, or if you are in the process of losing your spouse, we hope this has helped you. If we can be of assistance, please reach out to us at the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Until the next episode of Truth on Wheels, stay faithful.